you all so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Oh, that is, that is just not the strength of the WCV. Good morning, everybody. Now yeah, we're talking. Thank you so much, Shannon and Joan and the board and the staff of WCV for your incredible commitment, dedication, passion. These have not been easy years and you all have been leading a very, very important conversation in this state about how we grow and expand our movement. So let's give it up for this room, for this organization and for all of our supporters. I also want to give a special shout out to the great delegation that I joined, Derek and Susan. It's been so wonderful to serve with you, Adam Smith and Denny Heck and uh, Rick Larson and our senators. Um, I feel like I'm coming into a wonderful, wonderful group of people that are so committed and have spent their life dedicated to public service. So thank you for that. And congratulations, Reuven, wherever you are, for your award. Um, really fabulous work. And yes, I do miss the state senate, especially if you take back the majority. Um, that's going to be really painful to watch from the minority. But how wonderful that my good friend, Manka Dingra, that I've known for 20 years, is going to help turn Washington blue and allow us to move forward on significant climate <laughs> protections. So I'm so honored to be here and to represent this congressional district, the seventh congressional district, and forgive me, Derek and Susan, but you know, everyone says that they represent the best district in the country, but I actually do represent the best district in the country. Um, and it is really because we, uh, not only in this district, but across the state, have led the country in so many ways. We have the most beautiful and life-giving natural resources all around us, from the Puget Sound to our clean waters, to our mountains, and also to the people in this room, this region, and this state who understand exactly what it means to have gifts given to us and then to be the stewards of those gifts into the future, fighting for our planet and for all of our people. This is a room full of some of the smartest organizers, activists, and social change and environmental funders in the country. So let me be very frank about what we face and what we need to focus on. I've been an organizer my whole life. I sued the US government after 9-11 around illegal deportations of thousands of Muslims across the country and won, started Washington State's largest immigrant advocacy organization when immigration reform was not popular, even in the Democratic Party, and when very few elected officials would go and visit a mosque. I fought anti-immigrant hatred and led the largest voter registration drive in the history of the state. We registered 23,000 new American citizens to vote. And personally, I felt the sting of racism, being denied a room because of the color of my skin, being threatened with lynching, and much more. And so today I take the responsibility that I have to represent the intersections of economic justice, environmental justice, racial justice, and gender justice as the first Indian American woman in the U.S. House of Representatives. <laughs> as the first person of color in the Washington Democratic delegation to Congress. <laughs> and as one of only about a dozen or so immigrants in the United States Congress who have actually been born outside of the United States. Never in my years of advocacy and representation have I seen the threat to, to our democracy that I see today. Today we have sanctioned hate coming from the White House. We have a president who equates white supremacists with civil rights protesters. Someone who wants to relitigate the Civil War and deny the Holocaust. Donald Trump delights in speaking only to a shrinking minority of his base and using violence and divisive hate speech to bring out the worst possible instincts in humankind. He has dishonored our global standing in the world by pulling us out of the climate, Paris Climate Accord and by drastically cutting the number of refugees that we admit to this country, including increasing numbers of climate refugees. He has appointed to his cabinet an education secretary who does not believe in public education, 
a housing secretary who does not believe in public housing, an attorney general who does not believe in civil rights, and an EPA director who does not believe that climate change is real or that the environment needs protecting. He has continued to lie to and manipulate working Americans who thought that they were electing someone who would, sh who would shake up Washington in favor of their lives and their jobs. But instead, Trump and the Republican majority in the House and Senate have focused their efforts on transferring trillions of dollars of wealth from poor folks and middle class folks to the top 1% and the largest corporations. That is what their so-called health care plan was about, and that is what their tax plan is about. This president has lost the stature accorded to every president, Republican and Democrat, in recent history by his actions, bullying and taunting North Korea, keeping his finger hovering over a nuclear war button, cursing at NFL players for exercising their right to protest, and undermining the free press, the courts, and our government. On the environment, as much as the withdrawal from the Paris Accord was disastrous, equally disastrous in my mind, are the administrative actions that Trump and polluting Pruitt are taking to roll back hard-fought protections that we've won and sink us further into the mud on things that we can't even, frankly, keep up with. One example of this is the rolling back of the requirement instituted dur during the Obama years that we would take into account flooding and sea level rise when we build our infrastructure. And two days after that regulation was rolled back, Hurricane Harvey hit. What an insult to the people of Texas and Florida and Puerto Rico and of Louisiana before and the Virgin Islands. And I'm really happy to say that I just had a conversation with a Republican colleague yesterday. We're going to try to put together a bill to turn that back into law and reverse that regulation. <laughs> Using the Congressional Review Act process changes passed in the first weeks of Congress, Pruitt has repealed or is working to repeal rule after rule, undoing protections for large bodies of water, stopping the collection of data on emissions by oil and gas companies, destroying our national monuments, but not Hanford Reach, and allowing methane and other toxins to be released. Though, how about that federal judge that said, not so fast, suck a tash, and reverse that methane um, rule? The budget cuts in the budget just passed off the floor yesterday would decimate the EPA by 30%, as we all know. And today, in the wake of Harvey, Irma, and Maria, in the wake of forest fires and ash rain and blood red sunsets in Seattle, and in the wake of the horrific mass shooting in Las Vegas, it feels sometimes as if our country is unraveling at every scene. But the silver lining here is that we have the moment of a lifetime in front of us. Someone said to me the other day that we're in the era of Trump. And I said, no, we're not. We are in the era of the people. This is a movement moment, and we have to seize it with everything that we have. As a lifelong organizer, I know that our greatest strength comes in times of crisis. Crisis either tears us apart and pits us against each other, or it draws us together in refusing to allow for a hierarchy of oppressions. The reality is that if we didn't understand before how important it is that we pull together and broaden our coalitions and organize on the ground more than we've ever done and build the intersections amongst us, perhaps the one thing that Trump has done for us is show us what it takes to win and how completely and totally dependent we are on one another. How we must focus. You can clap for that. <laughs> How we must focus on intersectionality, a very clunky word, but the basic idea is that economic, environmental, racial, and gender justice are inseparable. They're not each in silos. The different kinds of oppressions that we face overlap with one another. And it's not about figuring out which one is worse. It's about taking on all of them and leaving no one behind. Yeah. 
Some of you have heard me say that I'm not a woman on Monday, an immigrant on Tuesday, a mom on Wednesday, and a worker on Thursday. I'm all of those things all of the time, and we are going to fight for all of those things all of the time. Intersectionality means recognizing that the effects of pollution and climate change disproportionately burden frontline communities, including communities of color, low-income communities, people with limited English proficiency, our indigenous peoples, and people living with disabilities. It means that as we make the critical shift from fossil fuels to clean energy, we must pay attention to the livelihoods of workers in different communities who still must have good union jobs and be able to contribute their full selves to our country. And our ability to overcome the challenges that we face and take back our country depends, depends on our ability to connect the dots across multiple issues and make sure that we fight for all of the changes we see in multiple parts of our society. And that is why I am so proud of WCV and labor and communities of color for forming the Alliance for Jobs and Clean Energy. That is what it takes to move forward. Dedicated work, time, deep dialogue, collaborative strategy sessions and evaluation to get to the point that we're at today. It takes holding each other accountable. Strong leaders in communities of color had to demand to be at the table in crafting solutions. Strong leaders in the labor community had to demand that we don't just say the words just transition, but we actually mean it. Strong leaders in the environmental community, like all of you in the room, had to stand up and lead and show others in the movement why we needed to broaden that decision-making table. Because for any one of us to succeed, we have to be fighting for all of us. And not only here, but around the world. I had the great privilege and honor of accompanying leader Nancy Pelosi on a delegation trip to India and Nepal, and we had the opportunity to meet with, his, spend two days actually with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And there were two issues that the Dalai Lama brought up in addition to Tibetan refugees, which was the, the big issue that we were talking about. One was climate change and protecting our climate and protecting our environment and his deep commitment to understanding that that's not actually something out there, it's right here in us. It's what we live in, it's what we breathe, it's what the water we drink, it is the place we live. And also, the other thing he was very clear about in front of Jim Sensenbrenner, our one Republican on the delegation, was that we should not build a wall along the southern border. And I also met with Prime Minister Modi, and my one question to him was about climate and what India was going to do. This was right before we pulled out of the Paris Climate, of, I shouldn't say we, President Trump pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord. And he said, we are just as committed as ever to taking on this issue, and we will surpass the goals that we set for ourselves. So in Washington, D.C., we, your Democratic delegation, is doing everything we can to fight for the issues that matter to us. And I am doing everything I can to use this platform that you have given me the honor of having to build our movement. And first, as an opposition party, which we must be because we're in the minority, we have to fight off all of the bad stuff. And we have a truly great delegation that's working on this. Um, and for me, as vice ranking member of the budget committee, as a senior whip for our caucus, as the first vice chair of the progressive caucus, I have made it a priority to focus on the environment along with immigration and health care, introduced along with Susan amendments in committee and on the floor, written letters to fight cuts to the EPA, restore Puget Sound cleanup, the fully fund transit, the list goes on. And make no mistake that in our opposition, the people united can never be defeated. And that's why we won three times on health care and made it clear, <laughs> made it clear that when you're in the streets, when you're on the phones, when you're in the congressional offices, and by the way, thank you, our, our office gets the most letters and mail of any congressional <laughs> district in the country. We get about 5,000 every week. So... Thank you. <laughs> but in addition to being an opposition party, we also have to be a proposition party. We have to propose what our vision of the future looks like, and then we have to stand up and call people into it and fight for it. And that's why I'm so proud 
to be one of the four original prime sponsors in the House of the 100 by 50 bill, Jeff Merkley's bill in the Senate. It is not theoretical. We can get to 100% renewable energy by 2050, maybe sooner if we really put our minds to it. And the bill lays out the path with investments in good jobs, in communities of color, in rebuilding the green infrastructure and electrifying our grid. And by the way, how about using Puerto Rico as a place to start as we rebuild that smart grid in Puerto Rico? And I've also created with my dear colleagues, Don McEachin from Virginia and Nanette Berrigan in California, the United for Climate and Environmental Justice Task Force, and we've introduced legislation policy that codifies the Office of Environmental Justice at the EPA, establishes the Office of Environmental Justice in the Oval Office, all things that Scott Pruitt is eliminating. But we feel it's important to stand up for the work that we know can be done in communities of color across this country, work like allowing grant funding to transition all public transportation to zero emissions, incentivizing the installation of solar panels for low-income families, and doing all of that, crafting all of that with the wisdom and the input of workers, unions, grassroots leaders, nonprofits, and government leaders. So you see, you can clap for that too. So you see, contrary to what my colleague Don Young thinks, this young lady knows a damn thing or two. And, and by the way, for those of you who haven't seen it or just saw pieces of it, that whole incident on the floor happened because I had spoken in opposition to his amendment to allow predatory hunting on federal parks lands. And yes, he did publicly have to apologize and I accepted that apology and that video now has four and a half million views across the country. <laughs> My good friend Naomi Klein, who I recently did a discussion with, calls confronting climate change our great opportunity to rebuild. She argues our economic model, these are her words, our economic model is at war with life on Earth. And she's right. We are not just tackling climate change as if that weren't big enough. We are recalibrating how we interact, distribute resources and costs, and most importantly, how we decide who makes these decisions? Is it a handful of the largest corporations who want to pollute the earth and take fossil fuels out of the ground? Or is it all of us, the people who inhabit this earth? We must bind ourselves to that simple principle that we are all better off when we're all better off. Our movement is strong, but we have to build even more strength by involving more people and bringing street heat to the fight. Because here's what I know as an organizer, if politics is the art of the possible, then the organizer's job, our job, inside Congress and outside, is to expand the boundaries of what is seen as possible. We need more of America to see themselves in our organizations and our elected bodies and to believe that their voices matter. And this is the moment because for the first time in a long time, people are woke and ready to engage. So we are ready to bring back to our conversations and our movements that deep knowledge that it is generosity and abundance that will always win, not scarcity and fear, and that love for each other is the great binding force for change. No great movement in the history of this country, whether to end slavery or fight for women to have the right to vote, has ever been easy. If it were easy, it would have been done. And so thank you to the Washington Conservation Voters for everything that you've done already and everything that I know we will do together as we make sure our resistance is rooted in truth and in community and as we root ourselves to the ground with every step forward that we take, we will win. Thank you all so much. <laughs>